All right, so uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, everyone, depending on whether you're joining from uh, North America or Europe. Uh, if you're attending this presentation, you probably uh, already subscribed to um, the AdProfs newsletter and you know who we are. Uh, but just in case you don't know, uh, my name is Ratko. I'm the founder of AdProfs. Uh, I'm also joined here by my colleague, Terry. Terry, Hello. how are you? Good, Ratko. So we got a lot to get through today. Uh, we did this last year uh, and there was definitely <clears> a lot of material. So we're going to try to keep this under an hour uh, and be respectful of your time. Uh, so we're going to skip through the bios and the agenda and just kind of get right into the, the major themes. But just for some context, uh, today's presentation uh, can be looked at sort of in a few ways. First, it's a comparative look back to see how the industry has changed, you know, over the course of a year. So we're going to compare 2017 to 2018, uh, and we think that should be valuable. At the same time, you can sort of think about this almost like an industry report card or performance review. So sort of, you know, what went well, what didn't go well, you know, what are the areas for improvement? What are the risks? Where are the opportunities? Uh, and then lastly, I think it's a great, good way for us to kind of revisit our predictions from last year, see how we did, um, and make new predictions based on new information. Um, also, one last bit of housekeeping. This presentation is being recorded. Um, I know a lot of people have asked, so we're going to be uploading it to our YouTube channel uh, later today. Uh, so don't worry if you have to, you know, drop off for whatever reason. That said, um, let's jump in. All right. So our first theme is ad fraud. And ad fraud, unfortunately, seems to be something of an evergreen theme in ad tech for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's basically systemic at this point as a result of how the uh, ecosystem is set up in an open manner and the way the incentives are structured. It really comes down to a lot of the business models in the industry, which is a percentage of media, seems to be the most standard for most companies. And that really creates a lot of incentive and a lot of structure for ad fraud. There's the encouragement of volume and quantity over quality, and, and you're talking about huge dollar amounts. And what that means is really there's automated buying. So once your algorithm is spinning, there's no human vetting, which allows for bad actors. They're not actively walking into an agency. They're not um, physically pitching a botnet. They're able to do it by phone or by email, if at that. <clears throat> so every year, it seems there are new developments on the ad front, ad fraud front. and Obviously, this is an important topic. I don't think we have to get into details of why that is. Marketers are throwing money away. Publishers are losing money and the industry is really being undermined by the existence of ad fraud. And this was a topic in 2017 um, that was important. We continued to see a lot of video fraud, namely arbitrage and fake pre-roll. We talked about that in our in last year's uh, webinar. Uh, we saw major fraud schemes like HypeBot, we saw domain spoofing stories, and we also saw the introduction of ads text, which was intended to help buyers find authorized inventory sellers and avoid spoofing. So that was the uh, big storyline for ad fraud uh, in 2017. So Rackle, let's talk a little bit about what happened in 2018 with regards to ad fraud. Sure. So I think, um, you know, there was, there was promising developments. Uh, there was, you know, incremental improvement. Um, no silver bullets um, in many ways, kind of more of the same, but just through new channels. Um, so first we saw, you know, ads dot, ads dot text or ads dot txt gain traction. Um, you know, I think it's reached critical mass from the uh, publisher's perspective. Um, some DSPs have already, you know, introduced offerings to only buy on authorized inventory or inventory that's been authorized by ads.txt. Um, so, you know, adoption numbers from publishers are, are pretty uh, fantastic, north of 80%. Um, I think we've seen a lot less video arbitrage and domain spoofing schemes um, on desktop, at least, um, in 2018. Um, however, I think one area where there's still a lot of room for improvement is marketer adoption. Um, there was, you know, uh, a Digiday survey, I believe, in uh, last year, uh, that showed that you know only 23% of media buyers said that they only purchase inventory through uh, that was been authorized by ads.txt. So there's definitely a huge um, uh, gap in between publisher adoption and marketer adoption. That's kind of um, crazy when you think about it. Yeah, 
yeah, it is. And, you know, we, in a newsletter, you know, we went into various reasons why that might be. So I think there's, I, I think it's crazy for any, you know, CMO or any marketer to buy unauthorized inventory, but, you know, then again, there's, um, you know, there's certain habits and, you know, marketers are used to buying very cheap inventory, uh, or they're used to expecting inventory to be a certain price. And so I think that there's a expectations mismatch, um, uh, you know, once inventory becomes authorized and, uh, you know, you're buying the real stuff, you know, you know, you're buying a, a real Rolex, uh, you're paying full price, you're paying full price, right? Yeah. Um, but that's, that's something that's a, I think it's, um, expectation that needs to, that needs to change. Um, other than that, there was also a uh, development on the open RTB 3.0 spec. So that's in the final stages right now. That's another positive development, um, in, you know, in the ad fraud, um, under the ad fraud sort of umbrella, um, still very, you know, early stages. So it hasn't really made an impact on the ecosystem, but, um, it's, you know, it's promising. It, it basically introduces more security, more ad quality, um, at kind of as a core component of, uh, the open RTB infrastructure. Um, but at the same time, there's expected to be, you know, kind of long and a long ad adoption cycle with regards to engineering. Um, so, you know, ad tech companies are going to have to, um, essentially rewrite their stacks and most likely have almost like two, um, two sets of infrastructure running simultaneously as, um, as the industry sort of migrates from, from the previous RTB spec to, to the new one. So, um, you know, there was, there was talk of, you know, best case scenario it happening sometime in 2019. I highly mm. doubt that, you know, I think that the soonest that we're going to see, you know, any kind of tangible results, uh, from open RTB is probably going to be sometime in 2020, probably best case scenario, I think. Yeah. Um, I People underestimate how much work has to go into actually rewriting this, these codes and getting the whole yeah. industry to do it. Yeah. And also, you know, you think about from a, from an ad tech company's perspective, you know, from a, from a product perspective um, and priority perspective, is it really the top priority out of, out of all the things that are, you know, out of, out of all the things that are going on, um, you know, is it going to, is it going to actually drive revenue in the short term? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I think that's always, you know, one of those, one of those tough decisions, but nonetheless, I think it's a promising development. Um, beyond that, we also saw, uh, law enforcement really begin, uh, in the, at least in the U S against ad fraud. Um, and that, that came sort of later on in the year when the U S department of justice brought charges against, um, eight people, um, all from the, you know, former Soviet union that were running, um, an ad fraud operation that was linked to, um, I believe it was the, um, um, the meth bot, uh, botnet, um, slash ad fraud scheme. So, um, you know, there's, uh, they were, they were saying that, uh, you know, it caused over, you know, 36 million in, in, um, kind of lost, lost ad spend. Um, and, it's interesting because you know the it, apparently the, the FBI became interested in this in this whole ad fraud scheme once they saw the white ops white paper um, around methbot um, and I think more specifically the Russian connection you know in their report. Um, yeah, I think definitely was a lot of overlap between some of the stuff that was happening in the uh, U.S. election and some of these advertising uh, fraud rings. Yeah, a lot of overlap yeah. in, in the tactics and the uh, probably the personnel, I would imagine. Yeah, and um, you know, you think with um, a, a, a botnet at scale, there's a lot of things you can do beyond fraud. Um, you know, there's you know, if you can control people's social profiles, there's there's things you can do in terms of spreading mis misinformation and you know, social social media manipulation and whatnot. So I think that there's a, there's a connection between the two, and that's probably one of the reasons that kind of spurred um, law enforcement to take action against it. Um, but, you know, I think it's, I think it's a very promising sign as well. Yeah, no doubt. Um, lastly, uh, you know, unfortunately major fraud schemes did continue and really kudos to Buzzfeed and Craig Silverman for, um, for writing extremely well researched um, long form uh, pieces about it. Uh, so there was 
a multitude of stories. Won't get into the details, but you know, publishers you know, buying cheap traffic only to find out that it's uh, fraudulent. Um, you know, Android apps, you know, steal, you know, mimicking human behavior to evade detection. Um, and really, you know, I think fraud has continued. It's just kind of going where the money is. And if money is shifting from desktop to mobile, then fraud is shifting from desktop to mobile as well. And mobile apps are, you know, just uh, kind of a perfect breeding ground right now for fraud. Um, there's no solution like ads.txt for uh, for mobile apps, um, but it's it's getting there. There's a, there's a spec in the works. Um, but in any case, uh, when, when looking forward to kind of 2019, I think that um, I, I, I'm hopeful. I think that advertisers are going to start targeting ads.txt inventory, uh, which is further going to sort of starve uh, fraudsters and starve uh, fraudulent publishers. Um, I think now that the FBI has acted, uh, we're going to see more action against fraud um, in the ad tech space uh, as well, which, uh, you know, I think also is going to include bad behavior from agencies as we saw last year, but we're going to cover that uh, in the next section. Um, same thing with ad fraud. I think ad fraud is going to continue to be uh, a problem, particularly in um, in mobile, um, as as budgets move move there. And I also think that, um, given the growth of areas like connected TV, it's also going to be a novel area, you know, a, a, an area for novel forms of fraud. Um, so, yeah, I think that that that's unfortunately where things are going to shift and and go in 2019. Yep, money moves there. Unfortunately, the fraud will follow. Yeah. So moving on. All right. So our next theme is transparency. Uh, it also seems to be another evergreen theme in ad tech. Um, and this is mainly because there are so many places where the industry has traditionally operated pretty opaquely. And as a result, uh, the discovery of these opaque practices uh, seems to be unending. In the early days, call it uh, you know a few years ago, the transparency was really focused on campaign reporting and where ads were showing up. And after that, the industry set its sights on, on ad fraud and viewability. In 2016, the industry focused on undisclosed rebates. That was the, the big push at that time, as well as media markups and, and some of the other shady practices that agencies were partaking in. Now, to recap last year's discussion, uh, the focus was mainly from publishers and it was a uh, it was with respect to shifted to undisclosed fees on the supply side, so namely exchanges and SSPs and the fees that they were taking from publishers. Mm -hmm. Last year we also saw marketers trying to get as much visibility as possible into auction mechanics, like understanding whether they were participating in a first price or a second price auction. So that that was really the focus of transparency in 2017. So let's talk about transparency in the year that just passed. Sure. So I think that there was, um, you know, more scrutiny of auction mechanics, you know, more demands for for fee and data transparency, and and ultimately more more desire to to take control. So um, first, with regards to you know opaque auction mechanics, um, again, unfortunately that that uh, continued. Uh, the big story this year was um, around index exchange, which was called out for um, yep. a practice called uh, bid caching. Um, that's where, you know, publishers uh, would essentially um, cash or save uh, a bid from advertisers or bids from advertisers uh, from the header auction and, and using them in subsequent auctions. And so this is, um, you know, good thing for publishers and it's it's better for yield. Um, but uh, I think I think a lot of the um, a lot of the concern was around disclosure. The practice was non-transparent. It was undisclosed and. I think um, safe to say most of the industry felt like it was uh, like an abuse of the auction or even, you know, borderline uh, fraudulent. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's uh, it, I think it, it's, it, it kind of speaks to a deeper issue, which is around uh, tech commoditization in the, you know, in the ad tech space specifically, uh, specifically on the on the exchange or SSP side. Um, and, and really the dilemma there is that um, if you embrace transparency, you know you you risk being copied by your by your competitors. Yeah. Um, if you avoid transparency, you know you risk getting slapped with you know embarrassment, you know over over undisclosed brand practice, you know undisclosed practices, which um, mm -hmm. kind of hurt your brand. Um, also, it kind of highlights the fact that you know 
the nature of how ad tech works and automation and programmatic advertising is that, you know, one company's servers are interfacing with another company's servers. And mm -hmm. the only people who truly understand how the auction mechanics work are really the developers of these companies. <laughs> um, and even then not, not every developer. Right. So, yeah. you know, granted there's, there's an increase, uh, you know, in demand for, you know, detailed log files from both advertisers and publishers. And there's some progress on that front, but ultimately I think auctions are still far from being, you know, fully transparent. There's also other, there was also other stories around, you know, wrapper neutrality, you know, header bidding wrapper neutrality. Again, we won't jump into the details there, but it's just, it was another example of, um, you know, things, things not being transparent, things being opaque and, you know, leading to, if not, if not actual impropriety, at least the perception of, of impropriety, which, you know, is a cause for concern and it can lead to, you know, allegations of, of, of kind of wrongful behavior. So that's, um, that's kind of, uh, on the, on the auction mechanics front. Uh, there was also, uh, I think more desire for fee transparency and and even transparency into um, kind of the makeup and provenance of um, data, you know, uh, targeting data segments. Um, so we we saw that on the on the fee transparency <clears throat> front, um, you know, DSP, you know, a lot of um, buyers, you know, looking for more transparency on the DSP side. So the year kind of started off with. Um, you know, a, a sort of a look at into undisclosed rebates from SSPs, you know, to um, test to to DSPs to sort of favor their favor their own supply. You know, this you know discrepancy fees, uh, undisclosed markup on data, for example, um, undisclosed markup on certain segments of inventory, and so on. So there was that you know, like you were talking about, you know, a second ago, transparency is is a very broad, very vague term, but it it's kind of rolling across different areas of the industry. So the areas that you mentioned earlier, you know, where my ads showing up was one area of transparency that was a big issue a few years ago. Now it's, it's about, you know, what are the actual small, you know, are there any kind of small undisclosed fees that my, you know, demand side platform are charging. Um, and then there's also, um, again, kind of like a renewed look, just like last year, a renewed look at, uh, fees that um, exchanges are are um, charging. So whether they're charging buy side or the buyers, or whether they're um, you know there's an increased uh, demand for a transparency into what are the publishers actually take rate right, on a publisher by publisher basis. Like what is you know what are the exchanges taking from from each publisher? So that was a that was kind of a big push this year as well, um, and. There was also news that AppNexus, for example, was you know re renegotiating its contracts with publishers, and I th think Rubicon as well. Um, either way, I think there's just a, a broader drive towards transparency on the on the fee side. Um, I completely agree, and and I think it had, comes down to trust. At the end of the day, the advertisers that are taking part in this industry want to feel that they're not being taken for a ride, and you know, unfortunately, there's been a lot of bad actors that have infiltrated the ecosystem. So everything from, you know, when you talk about auction mechanics to fees and data transparencies, I think that the participants want to know that, you know, th these are the rules that we've agreed to and that we've engaged in and we're willing to pay for. And, and they just want to be sure that they're not, you know, being taken advantage of. And I think that's where something like indexes bid caching made, made people feel so uncomfortable because people came into it with a certain expectation and then they realized, you know, the market isn't exactly what they were led to believe it was, or at least thought yeah. that it was. Yeah. I also think that's, that's a function of just how the, how the ad tech ecosystem kind of functions right now with like this split buy side and sell side, which mm -hmm. is sort of unseen anywhere else. So it, it, it's a bit, it's a bit of a double standard because you don't see the same pushes for transparency from, you know, it, at this level of detail, um, from Google and Facebook and a lot of the other walled gardens, um, no one like no one's browbeat, no one's browbeating Google over, you know, their take rate on, you know, AdWords mm -hmm. or, or, or anything like that. It's just kind of taken, you know, they, yeah. they just kind of let them, let them go. So, um, in any case, uh, just for the sake of time, data transparency, that was something else that last January, so about a year ago, I, I wrote that, you know, for all we know, 
the accuracy of third party data, third party data segments were going to be, you know, the next thing in the crosshairs. Um, like less than a month later, a month later, <clears throat> Lodemy purged 400 million profiles from its DMP because they were found to be, you know, bot profiles. Um, alcohol advertiser, um, Pernod Ricard, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, they discovered that their um, uh, third party data segments were often inaccurate. Um, so, in any case, the third-party data still remains, uh, I think, in large part, um, non-transparent or opaque. Um, and then, lastly, um, I think, you know, the demand for transparency is not really limited just to ad tech vendors, but also, you know, service providers as well. So, anytime there's a managed service relationship, there's also a risk of opaque behavior. Um, surveys showed, I believe, last year that 80% of advertisers had a desire uh, to bring programmatic buying in-house and you know there's different definitions of what constitutes in-house i think the difference also between desire and actually you know pulling the trigger is probably big but uh, you know even small increases in control can yield big transparency gains um there was also other studies that showed you know 40 percent of advertisers don't trust their agencies and you know the list goes on and on there's no doubt a Tr like a crisis of trust between marketers and agencies. And I would even say between marketers and agencies and ad tech vendors. Um, and we also saw late last year that, you know, the FBI was beginning to issue subpoenas um, in an investigation into shady media agency practices. So um, I think that's, that's, a, that's another area. I mean, it's not, it's not ad fraud, but it's a, it's a different form of, I mean, it's basically coming after non-transparent practices um, by, by service providers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so there was, uh, you know, a lot of troubling things there. There was a McKinsey report where, you know, a former, a former agency executive said that we wouldn't have a business if we didn't have rebates. Um, so just like very troubling, troubling kind of signs from the, um, kind of from the service world. Um, and in any case, I think that, that, uh, um, it, it's not just agencies, even, you know, there was other story around rocket fuel, and how they were using data largely in a managed service way like people weren't using it using their platform in a self-serve fashion it was it was kind of managed but the way that they were managing it was not um in retrospect ethical um so uh, in any case if i if i had to make some like 2019 predictions you know i, I still think that fee transparency is gonna is gonna be pushed on um there's vendors uh you know there were stories of vendors like in the blockchain space like uh what is it? Amino payments and lucidity, and they're they're sort of attacking this specifically. Um, again, that's it's 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 kind of very early days for that kind of stuff, but uh, I I do think that there's going to be pressure uh, sort of against opaque fee, opaque fees, which um, are still pretty uh, pretty rampant. Um, third party data. I mean, I don't see that getting transparent. But I, I think that'll be. <laughs> I think the third party data will actually be outlawed before it ever gets transparent. Hmm. Um, but I do think that brands are going to continue to press for more control, not necessarily take things in-house. Uh, that's that's kind of like a um, very I I idealistic uh, notion. Not uh, definitely not impossible. Really depends company by company. But I do think that the desire is going to continue to increase. Um, and you know, but unfortunately, like you know, you're a lawyer. Uh, undisclosed kickbacks, rebates, those things are are practically impossible to 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 police so um unfortunately i don't know i don't know how well that's going to improve they're, they're very difficult absolutely uh well, good segue into the uh third thing which is privacy and legal <clears throat> so privacy and legal uh is, is probably one of the biggest themes of, of 2018 if not the biggest in this section we're going to talk about laws that relates to privacy regulation both in europe but also this year in the us and beyond <clears throat> so going back to our 2017 recap we saw gdpr coming um and you know it, the gdpr was, was an eu regulation that mandated a way that personal information of anybody in the eu can be accessed stored and used and it really imposed really, really deep obligations on companies that were interacting with these users to get consent and get informed consent and use that information the way that they said that they were going to. So we, we wrote a lot about this um, during the year. We wrote about the potential implications on the ad tech industry. Um, these are published on our site if you want to go back and find them. And you know we also observed a, a slew of lawsuits between various vendors in the supply chain in, in ad tech. 
Um, and it was around the same time that we saw the rise of, of privacy consciousness with early reporting about Cambridge Analytica and the US election. So 2017, this was definitely a big topic. Um, let's talk about 2018, because uh, I think if anything, it only got bigger. Yeah. Yeah. 2018 was, you know, lots of drama. I think a lot of heavy handedness uh, from from players that had leverage, lots of uncertainty. Um, so GDPR went into effect on May 25th last year. A uh, handful of companies pulled out of Europe in advance of GDPR. So, you know, TapAd cross, uh, was a cross device vendor. Uh, Drawbridge also cross device. Verve uh, location data. Um, thousands of sites or publishers, you know, cut off access to EU users completely. Um, there was also a uh, best effort attempt by the IAB to sort of maintain uh, the status quo. Um, so that they released the transparency consent framework uh, in April, about a month before GDPR went into effect. Um, this was sort of a, a framework that publishers would use um, as the basis for their consent management platforms or CMPs, which were sort of a new breed of vendor in 2018. Um, you know, at the time I wrote that it was, or, or that, that it seemed rushed and, and, and kind of wishful. Um, uh, and now we're sort of nine months later and the jury is still kind of out on whether it's even a viable or compliant solution for publishers. Uh, but the good thing is that it's flexible. There's a, you know, there, there's committees that are in charge of it. So I think that it's going to adapt to whatever the guidance is from, um, um, uh, from regulators. But I do think that the, the main, the main challenge is around, um, the, the actual consent string and being able to prove that consent was gathered in a compliant way. Because um, mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's somewhat subjective at this point. Like you have to see how the, how the actual consent dialogues are being um, formed. And that's, uh, that's hard at this point. There's no, there's no real strong way to, to verify or validate that, that the consent is valid. And, you know, there was uh, reports of, you know, fake consent strings being sent to the RTB uh, RTB bid requests, which makes a lot of sense, you know, having a consent string, uh, makes the impressions more valuable. Um, mm -hmm. so that was kind of predictable. Um, Google also, you know, it, it sort of adapted its funding choices tool, uh, which was originally sort of an ad anti ad blocking feature. I believe it's still in beta. They kind of adapted that to be a consent gathering tool as well. Um, initially limited it to 12 ad tech vendors, which caused quite a bit of stir. Then they, you know, lifted that limit after the industry kind of raised hell. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, there was, there was just a lot of, there was a lot of drama, uh, right around GDPR. You I mean, Google diverted a lot of its demand from its DSP to its own ad exchange. Uh, everyone kind of freaked out. Um, but that was kind of remedied with contracts. So exchanges <clears throat> essentially assumed liability for any kind of privacy violations just to kind of get back into, uh, you know, to make Google feel more comfortable. A um, couple of months later, we saw that, uh, you know, two, two kind of small French startups uh, received uh, violation, GDPR violations for collecting geolocation data. They were given three months to become compliant. Um, there was also a research that came out that showed that, you know, the prevalence of ad trackers um, in, in Europe declined anywhere from 18 to 31% since GDPR, um, whereas, you know, Google's presence actually continued to go up. Um, so it was sort of early, um, early confirmation that GDPR was sort of mostly beneficial to Google and de detrimental to smaller ad tech companies. And then that was kind of, kind of to be expected, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 it was uh, sort of expected. And, you know, a lot of people called it like a sort of like an own goal by, by EU regulators. Um, at the same time, you know, there was, there was again, more action against, uh, another French, um, ad tech startup called, uh, Vectory, I believe. Um, and they were, um, again, for geolocation data, um, uh, sort of collecting geolocation data in a way that wasn't compliant. They were also given three months to purge their, purge all the data and become compliant. Um, and, and so on. So I think action was mostly, mostly towards this, uh, you know, latter, latter, latter end of the year, mostly against smaller ad tech startups in the, in the location data space. And then, you know, last week there was the big, big announcement of, you know, the, the 50 million euro fine against, uh, against Google. But, um, this is a 2018 retrospective. So, uh, we're going to focus on, on 2018. Um, next, uh, this was, this was, this was big, uh, basically privacy regulation became a, a pretty big issue in the U S um, right around the time of the 
Facebook and Cambridge Analytica scandal, there, you know, Tim Cook started calling for regulations. Senators started drafting privacy-related bills. Uh, the big shocker was the, you know, California Consumer Privacy Act, which, which um, sort of came uh, came out of left field and and sort of blindsided the industry and sort of forced the entire tech industry, not just the ad tech industry, but just the tech ind- the tech industry, um, you know, as a whole to sort of abandon the, the the notion of self-regulation um uh, because you know it, it just basically led to the, the the california law passing basically opened the doors for you know a, what they call you know a patchwork of state level regulation so um in order to sort of preempt that um the the industry said oh maybe maybe we should support federal federal regulation and you know obviously in the hopes that it can be uniform but also i think partially in, in hopes that it could be a little bit more watered down. Um, there was a there was a very interesting quote from from an IAB representative um, later in the year, uh, which said like, you know, the guys basically said, when pen gets taken to paper, we just want to make sure that the collection and use of data isn't altered. So I think it's very clear what the um, objective of at least the IAB is uh, when it comes to you know pri- privacy regulations in the U.S. Um, and then other than that. You know the the legal action that we saw the lawsuits between between ad tech companies you know like uber suing its agency and the the agency counter suing and then you know data zoo suing rhythm one i think we didn't see many lawsuits fall, filed in 2018 which is probably a good thing um rubicon settled with guardian um i think we also heard that uber settled with fetch it just wasn't a lot written about it um but you know i think that sort of mexican standoff is, has, has sort of ended hmm. um in terms of 2019 predictions, uh, I think it's safe to say privacy is going to get more restrictive, not less, and it's going to reach far beyond the EU. Just last week, we saw Microsoft CEO uh, Satya Nadella calling for GDPR-like regulation in the US and even a global privacy standard. Um, in Europe, we still have the e-privacy uh, directive that's in the works, uh, which governs you know, the use of cookies and, and, and the prohibition of tracking walls, potentially. And, um, that's coming in 2020. Uh, the California Consumer Privacy Act is coming in 2020. Um, there's, you know, the debate over federal privacy law in the U.S., which is, you know, going to be heavy this year. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, so really, it's like a multi, multi-front attack on behavioral, behavioral advertising, really, which I think is uh, maybe on the positive side going to re, going to result in a sort of <laughs> renewed renewed interest in privacy-friendly forms of targeting, like you know, contextual, and so yeah. on. I think this is going to be a very big issue in 2019. Yeah. So um, moving along to theme number four, web browsers. If you're a regular leader, a regular reader of uh, the newsletter, you'll understand why web browsers have their own section. The, the major web browsers, uh, you know, Google, Apple, Mozilla, and others, they pose a unique threat to the ad tech industry. So when we were talking about 2017, we were talking about the announcement of Chrome's upcoming ad filter, which is one of the factors in, in terms of driving publishers to clean up intrusive or obnoxious ads on their sites, uh, you know, mm-hmm. as, de- as defined by Google. Uh, we also saw the introduction of the first version of Safari's ITP fe- feature, uh, which almost immediately had an impact on some of the ad tech companies like, like Criteo. So um, web browsers being such an important part of the ad tech ecosystem, uh, what happened in 2018, Racco? Yeah, so I think uh, we saw, you know, lots more of the same in 2018, sort of as, as predicted. Um, Google's, you know, Google Chrome's ad filter didn't have as much of an impact as as we initially thought. Um, you know, it was going to start blocking annoying ads, but, and I think it had to to a degree, it just wasn't rolled out generally. Um, but the latest uh, latest information says that it's slated for for mid 2019, so it's it's kind of too soon to tell the impact there. Um, other than that. Safari, uh, Safari or Apple Safari um, got way more aggressive with the release of ITP 2.0, um, which is its you know intelligent tracking prevention. Um, it, it thwarted some circumvention techniques that companies like Critio used, for example, and uh, you know what they called first-party bounce. Um, they also referred to basically the practice of cookie matching or, or user ID matching that the ad tech industry relies on. They referred to that as tracker collusion, which I thought was funny. Um, they also blocked social sharing buttons, um, like like buttons, for example, from Facebook, they blocked those, uh, unless users actually 
explicitly gave them permission. They eliminated the practice of fingerprinting. So it kind of poured a lot of co cold water on the uh, on a good portion of the ad tech industry, including um, you know Facebook and Google. Um, and you know they, it's it's interesting because Apple Apple it, it's just it's it's very congruent with Apple's um, position and being a champion of you know user privacy and um, and and all of that. Um, there's, you know, there's at the time I wrote that, you know, there was a risk that other browsers are going to follow suit. Um, that's pretty much what happened. Um, I also, you know, question whether, you know, G Apple was positioning itself to, to create an upcoming ad network, um, hmm. which I think is, is, is a very interesting concept that, you know, looking back more and more, it seemed like that's a case. And, you know, it, that was also echoed recently by, by a senior analyst at Arete Research, uh, Richard Kramer, um, who also believes that, you know, Apple's going to launch a contextual sort of privacy-friendly advertising platform. And when you think about it, Apple more broadly, it makes total sense given their sort of decline in, 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 in product sales and sort of the, the pivot to services revenue. Um, also, Tim Cook's been pounding very hard for like federal privacy regulations, saying that, you know, people need, uh, you know, well-crafted laws and whatnot. Um, so in any case, uh, it, it, he, he seems to be a proponent of like very much like GDPR, like regulation in the U S, um, which is, uh, you know, could be very good for Apple, um, uh, but not good for, for a lot of other companies. Um, and again, uh, I wrote that, you know, it's, it seems like it's going to be likely that Firefox is going to follow in Apple's footsteps with similar, similar functionality, which is again, going to pose a greater risk to the, to the, to the ecosystem. That's exactly what happened. Um, in October 2018, Firefox released update 63, which included, you know, all of its uh, <clears throat> anti tracking features, um, which is interesting because you made a, you made a prediction last year saying that, you know, we're going to see continued aggression from uh, walled gardens, especially from from browsers. Yeah. Um, so what's going to what's going to happen in 2019? I think I think, you know, it's going to. It's unfortunate, but I think that, you know, browsers are going to get more aggressive, not less. Um, everyone seems to be sort of uh, following the leader, which was, you know, Apple. Um, browsers are basically the gatekeepers to the web. There is almost no recourse against them. You know, any of the changes they make, ad tech industry basically has no leverage against them. It's very highly doubtful that regulators are going to step in anytime soon. <clears throat> or, um, I mean, they may, but it's, um, it's, it's looking doubtful. Um, there's potential that Chrome is going to make similar changes just based on the slow shifts that they're making, you know, and, and some of the changes they made with the most recent versions of Chrome seems like that's going to happen. Um, you know, what, what's most likely to happen is that, you know, P, there's going to be a bunch of PR backlash from, I think, publishers and advertisers to try to sway sort of public and regulatory opinion, sort of force browsers, you know, browbeat them basically to stay friendly towards, towards ad tech, um, you know, in a perfect yeah. world, in a perfect world, they would all cooperate and offer like a one, you know, one like advertising ID essentially that everyone can 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 use and share. But I think that's uh, I think that's very much like wishful thinking at this point. Yeah, I agree. And uh, the uh, the likely result will 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 have some sort of impact on on the wall gardens, <laughs> and uh, you know the wall gardens. Um, most most readers will know we're talking about closed platforms that generate their own data and sell their own advertising units. Um, in essence, an integrated end-to-end -end solution that is mainly self-attributing. Um, you know, we're talking about Google and Facebook generally. And, um, you know, the, in, in 2017, we were talking about their dominant position in, in the digital ad industry. Um, quote unquote, they were sucking the oxygen out of digital advertising, uh, we said at the time, as they continued to grow their collective market share. And in uh, one of the, you know, big things that we were talking about in 2017 was the, the rise of potential challengers. So we we're talking about Verizon's Oath project, which was a combination of AOL and Yahoo. And we saw some uh, data, data consortiums um, being created to challenge the scale offered by the top platforms. And in 2017, there was um, there was a lot of, uh, call it momentum or at least, um, uh, optimism that, that we would get some challengers to the uh, traditional walled gardens of Google and Facebook. <clears throat> so, um, how'd that play out in 2018, Racco? Yeah. So 
it's it's still very much a duopoly with Facebook and Google, but we're seeing more and more competition growing, mainly from I think other small smaller walled gardens, smaller platforms. Uh, no real threats from non-tech companies. No real threats from industry consortiums. Um, and and you know there's there's basically like a, a a a flight so to speak to you know everyone's kind of banking on the uh, advanced tv space as a way to sort of yeah. capture tv tv budgets and not have to compete head to head with google and facebook in the in the dr space so essentially like playing a different game but um but on the you know on the facebook and google front there was a slight stumble just in terms of the growth <laughs> that, that was captured by by google and facebook so you know they uh, you know, according to some some analysts, it, you know, Facebook and Google were responsible for around 75% of the digital advertising growth. Um, but, you know, they were capturing less than before. And, you know, it's kind of believed that, uh, you know, you, Amazon is basically that 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 the the difference kind of w- went to Amazon, given the, the the crazy growth that that Amazon experienced. But we'll talk about it in the next section. Um, aside from that, um, Again, no real no real threats from from the potential challengers or from the um, the non tech challengers. So you know we saw last year or not the last year but in 2017 we saw the introduction like you said of Oath and Verizon, which was promising in theory but turned out to be sort of lackluster in execution. Um, still a very big company, still you know billions in in in, in ad revenue, but um, you know not not quite. They didn't live up to the promise. Yeah, didn't live up to the promise. Um, you know there was there was you know, stories mid-year last year that they were going to sell it off for like price of 10 billion. Then, you know, come fall, the uh, the CEO Tim Armstrong left. Most of his, you know, lieutenants. Um, there was disagreements. Basically, Verizon was shy about using their wireless subscriber data to enrich um, Oath's advertising business. Um, mm-hmm. Basically, felt like it wasn't worth the, you know, whatever incremental upside of that sort of three four billion dollar business. Um, and so that kind of I think also helped, you know, led to the subpar results. Um, last month, they wrote down the entire uh, Oath business to buy about you know, four or five million dollars, sorry, four or five billion dollars, um, wow. and renamed it to Verizon Media Group. So, um, again, also lots of layoffs in the last 60 days. And um, there was also, uh, we'll talk more about, you know, this acquisition later, but, you know, there was also the AT&T acquisition of, App Nexus, yeah. not really a direct challenger to Facebook and Google. Um, they've made it pretty clear their focus is on, you know, the lin- linear TV market. Um, there was also smaller um, consortiums like publisher consortiums, which we saw. <laughs> like the, there's initiatives like Ozone Project in the UK, uh, which is like major major publishers like Guardian, News UK, Telegraph, um, offering, uh, you know, what they what they pitch is brand safe, fraud free, premium news environments less of a challenge to walled gardens more of a defensive move i would say um jury is still out whether that's actually going to move the needle in terms of you know shifting ad budgets away from you know walled garden platforms but that's still uh in development um with regards to data consortiums id consortiums again um no real threat there um there was the advertising id consortium um which kind of had a had a turbulent year um, App Nexus pulled out after uh, they were acquired. Um, Trade Desk has really been pushing its um, proprietary ID product called Unified ID, which seems clearly like a re- like a alternative to DoubleClick's ID, which was removed by Google um, also last year, um, but still still very much proprietary. Um, so <clears throat> anyway, not not a lot not a lot of promise there in 2018. Um, and then, like we talked about. There's, you know, competing with head-to-head with a duopoly is is, is pretty hard, um, if not impossible. So, mm-hmm. what almost everyone's doing in ad tech is fleeing towards programmatic TV. Um, you know, there's there's also um, a battle a battle I think they can win. Yeah, I mean, it makes a lot more sense, right? Like you you fight fight on on your own turf, not on not on their turf. Um, yeah. And I think in a large part that's kind of going after TV budgets. There's a $70 billion TV market in the US that kind of everyone's chasing after, which are primarily brand budgets, you know, cause it's it's just too hard to compete with Facebook and Google and Amazon for DR budgets. Mm-hmm. Um, but then the, another challenge is that, you know, everyone's going after those budgets. So it's, uh, there may not be like a natural monopoly over TV supply, but you know, competition's pretty fierce. You got yeah. Netflix, Amazon, YouTube, you know, Roku, Hulu, 
you know, Warner Media now jumping in the mix. And then on the ad tech side, you have, you know, all these major DSPs that are now like kind of changing their positioning, changing their tune, you know, Trade Desk, you know, CEO basically saying programmatic TV is the future, data zoo, media math, beeswax, everyone's everyone's kind of um, talking about connected TV and, and programmatic TV as the, you know, as, as the future. Yeah. But uh, very much, very much a different beast from digital banner ads. So uh, uh, 2019, what do you think is going to happen? I mean, I think sort of like we like, like we mentioned last year, like a lot of this stuff, there, there's 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 rarely any kind of seismic shifts. I think that it's basically more of the same. So Facebook, I think Facebook and Google are continue to, you know, Hoover up Hoover up budgets. Um, you know, if anyone basically if anyone leaves Facebook, it just it means less competition, which makes the ad platform even more attractive from an ROI perspective. You know, rates get better. Um, it, it's just too addictive or effective of an ad product um, for, for many marketers. Uh, Google, I think, is going to continue to, you know, be <laughs> heavy handed and anti-competitive and kind of force marketers to make a choice between, you know, whether they want to go the open route or go the closed route. So kind of forcing adoption of, you know, Google's ads data hub for data management and so on, where basically essentially data goes in, doesn't come out. Um, and it's, it's, it's going to split marketers between those who are, you know, comfortable sort of seeding a, a degree of control uh, to sort of wall gardens and then those who want to retain more independent control over their own kind of measurement. Um, I also don't think that data and identity consortiums are going to go anywhere. Um, I just think they they lack they lack the, the the same quality of sort of logged in data. They lack the scale. Um, the, I think the only companies that, 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 that really have that sort of uh, data at scale are, are kind of large telecom companies. Um, also, I think any solution right now, given the climate that's based on cookies, is, is sort of doomed from the start. Um, just given M&A climate, strategic interests, regulatory climate, um, there's there's very little consent, con, you know, incentives to cooperate. There's also risks around, you know, regulatory risks around sort of building identity solutions. So, yeah, not not very <laughs> bullish on on on, on data consortiums. Okay, well. In terms of uh, walled gardens, uh, I think the most interesting one we'll talk about next is uh, is, is Amazon. I think that they've got the uh, the most unique pieces, the most momentum, and biggest opportunity. But um, we we Amazon is is uh, we give it a category of its own, giving it given its meteoric rise in the ad tech sector. Um, mm -hmm. Mind you, they've been involved in ad tech for a while, mainly on the sell side with their header bidding product and their A9 division. But in recent years, the company has been developing its tools for buyers, um, which are actually now quite material. <clears throat> so let's recap 2017. Amazon sort of came out of nowhere in 2017, um, surpassing a billion in revenue and get, getting lots of mind share in the DSP category, uh, most notably for its unique purchase and interest data that was based on activities that users were performing on its platform. Um, Amazon has talent, they have resources, they have unique data, they have unique inventory. Um, they've got a strong brand, they've got scale. Basically everything that you would need to compete with Google and Facebook, Amazon has. So mm -hmm. um, let's talk about uh, 2018. Let's talk about Amazon in 2018. Yeah, so Amazon last year, 2018, fast growth. Um, you know, basically exceeded all estimates of them. Uh, there's, you know, that they don't disclose these numbers uh, specifically in their earnings reports, but the estimates are anywhere from, um, you know, 5 billion to, uh, I've heard as high as 10 or 11 billion. Um, so it's really, it's really broad, but I think it's safe to say that they, that they earned at least uh, 5 billion uh, in, uh, in 2018, when I think eMarketer estimated that they would be somewhere like low threes. Um, so basically, you know, blew away expectations, basically solidified their spot. So I think they started the year in like number five. So it was like Google, Facebook, um, Microsoft, Oath, and then Amazon. And now at the end of the year, Amazon is a very strong number three. Um, still, you know, they're, they're not in the same league as Facebook and Google, but they're growing incredibly fast. Um, so like over a hundred percent year, year over year. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, some 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 um, research firms are saying that they're going to reach like 16 billion in a couple of years. Uh, so it's it's it, it's phenomenal growth. Um, in terms of their ad offerings, they consolidated all of them. So they used to have a variety of different ones like Amazon Marketing Services and Media Group and Amazon Advertising Platform, and they just kind of all consolidated that. 
under Amazon advertising, um, which is kind of less less confusing for marketers. Uh, their DSP matured um, in 2018, so they added an API, uh, you know, which uh, you know allowed companies to kind of easier. In, you know, integrate more easily with their reporting and their internal systems and allow companies to sort of build on top of Amazon's DSP. Um, we saw improvement in their user interface. We saw that they were uh, testing a new attribution product. Uh, we also saw the company was piloting a search retargeting, essentially what is a search retargeting product, which I think has lots of potential for Amazon and marketers. That said, you know, there's there's also reports that like, the DSP still has a long way to go. It's still, it's still very much a new DSP. It still has all the unique differentiators, but it's still playing catch up on, I think, a lot of the the creature comforts that that uh, media buyers have expected from like a mature DSP. Mm-hmm. Um, other than that, I mean, last year there were um, there were reports that Amazon was going to be looking for a corp dev role. There were, you know, uh, res- that that role was going to be responsible for like media related acquisitions. That led to speculation that they were going to buy some ad tech companies. Mm-hmm. We, th- we 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 said that they were going to buy, you know likely going to buy a company in 2018 that didn't materialize um, yet. Um, but I do think that, that there's still potential for, I mean, I mean, I think that would also telegraph a lot of their, a lot of their intentions. Um, and right now I think their, their advertising platform is still relatively under the radar. Yeah. Do you think they'll buy someone in 2019? I, I, I do. I, I do think that there's, uh, there's potential there, especially like on the on the DSP front. I'm, I mean, I'm I'm kind of torn. At one point, I thought that it was very clear they were going to buy a DSP, just given how much work needed, uh, work it needed. But then, you know, s- seeing seeing some of the improvements, um, it seems like they're they are actively working on it. It's it, it's improving, and it is Amazon after all. So they have the the resources resources and the talent to to improve their in their their products, kind of their core competency. So I'm. I mean, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think they're. I I, I think they can make a make an acquisition. They're, um, but at the same time, I'm uh, I'm 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 kind of torn. I'm, I'm torn on that. But I do think that there's potential that they're going to do something pretty disruptive in 2019. Uh, whether it's you know becoming a loss leader on the exchange side, for example, with like like a zero margin exchange uh product. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, there's also possibility. I mean, they don't have a very they don't have a fully self serve ad platform like Facebook or Google. You know, they don't have a, like a truly self-service offering, so I think that's that's another area where they can sort of jump or, or kind of throw their hat in the ring and, you know, make a make a splash. Totally. Okay, so let's move on to our seventh and final theme: consolidation. <clears throat> so, consolidation. Uh, you know, we're talking about at a very general level the reduction of companies in the space. This can come from m and it can come from a shakeout where, where companies go out of business or they get sold for, for parts. Um, generally, consolidation tends to happen at the end of an innovation cycle, which, you know, it feels like this is where we are with ad tech, at least in the current iteration. And so, you know, we've got uh, an industry where a lot of uh, investment came into it, uh, call it seven to 10 years ago. Investors are looking for their returns. Um, we're starting to see the winners and losers being picked. <clears throat> And when we were talking about the consolidation in 2017, we saw um, we're talking about quite a few acquisitions. Uh, the competition was heating up, specifically around fees and, and price wars, and you know we saw we saw layoffs occurring as well. Um, so it definitely seemed in 2017 that 2018 would be the year of consolidation. So um, let's talk about that. Sure. So I think in 2018 we we basically saw more of the same. Um, at roughly the same pace, maybe a slight, maybe a slight uptick uh, in, in M&A um, and in and, and private equity money. So, you know, I think my, my prediction last year about like kind of Luma Partners being the big winners, um, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not so sure. I think that's kind of neutral uh, in terms of the outcome. I think there was pr- a pretty average amount of M&A in ad tech, uh, nothing earth shattering. I think most of the spoils went to um, MarTech companies. Um, there was, you know, there was still, you know, a good amount of uh, of M&A. We saw Grapeshot go to Oracle, Axiom Marketing Services go to IPG, AdsWiz got acquired by Pandora, AppNexus went to AT&T, mm-hmm. um, which I think a lot of people predicted. Um, Datarama went to Salesforce. Videology kind of was a bit of a des- desperate sale, uh, went to Amobi. Um, Integral Ad Science was acquired by private equity firm Vista. DataZoo... Didn't didn't sell, but there was reports that they hired bankers. Um, I was wrong last year about my prediction that Rubicon was going to get acquired. Um, 
I think that's just a function of time. So I don't, I don't think, I, I, I think I was wrong timing wise, but I, I think 2019 will be their year. Um, half a dozen, there was about half a dozen kind of notable funding announcements like media math raising like over 200 million from private equity. Yeah. App Lovin raised over 400 million from private equity. Factual raised something like 42 million. Sovereign raised 25 million. Um, so not a ton of funding announcements, um, but still, still some. Um, there was, you know, for a number of reasons, uh, you know, stories of publishers and agencies basically reducing the number of vendors they work with, uh, whether it's privacy reasons, uh, privacy compliance reasons to like reduce their liability, uh, reducing the risk of data leakage, um, ads at TXT, cutting off, you know, resellers and prioritizing direct relationships, um, improving user experience, faster load times, again, less less data leakage risk. Um, so another another kind of trend trend we observed, um, and then. You know, from a from a layoffs perspective, it's another kind of effect or result from from from, from consolidation. So we saw fairly fairly widespread sort of layoffs from different companies. Um, Oath, basically 10,000 people took severance packages in December last. I think it was last week. Seven percent of of Verizon Media, which was formerly Oath, were let go. OpenX laid off 100 people in December. Rubicon laid off 100 people back in March, I think. Um, Ad Colony cut jobs. Rev Rev content cut jobs, Defy Media shut down completely. I think Visto, which was formerly Collective, filed for bankruptcy. So, uh, you know, layoffs from failures, but also companies wanting to become profitable given the uh, given the overall climate. But there's, I think, in all this, it's pretty obvious what the um, negatives are of, of of layoffs, right? It's pretty obvious that at an individual level, it's disruptive to people's lives. You know, layoffs yeah. suck from individual's perspective, no doubt. But I think on the positive side, there's thousands of experienced people on the market. Now, you know, up until now, it's been a pretty well-known challenge, you know, hiring experienced talent, especially in the programmatic advertising space. You know, so if you, given the challenges of hiring people that have domain expertise in ad tech, I think that, you know, the layoffs can also be a, you know, welcome opportunity for companies like agencies, consultancies, you know, brands that are looking to bring ad tech operations in house maybe larger tech platforms that have advertising ambitions and so on. So um, at the same time, I think that competitors are also uh, in a good position, you know, to hire, let's say, former employees from rivals. It's always a great way to gather competitive intelligence. Uh, mm -hmm. So th to the extent that they can be useful, you know, uh, that's that's uh, that's made possible whenever there's layoffs, especially at scale. Um, I also think that, you know, there's going to be a lot more uh, Let's call it consultants in the in the ad tech space. Maybe a flight of talent to other maybe less volatile uh, industries. Yeah. So, so we, we talked about the uh, the innovation cycle coming to an end. And it seemed like a lot of the uh, new stuff that was coming online was more incremental rather than game changing. And I think you know now with the consolidation, with the talent that's becoming available, with the uh, the next battleground, call it programmatic TV. Uh, whether it's actual programmatic TV or some form of other uh, visual entertainment that that occurs um, <clears throat> through Netflix or through YouTube or through some other channels, um, you know, let's talk about the future. Let's talk about uh, 2019 and beyond. Yeah. So, I mean, we're really what we're seeing right now is kind of like the end of an innovation cycle. Uh, you know, like you mentioned before, um, for every Videology or Yieldbot or Defy Media, there's also, you know, winners like Grapeshot and Datarama and AppNexus and so on. So, you know, th we're, we're going to see the more of the same as the, as sort of this cycle closes. Um, some companies are more at risk uh, sort of going out of business given the climate than others. So far, it looks like location data space is pretty vulnerable. Retargeting mm -hmm. space is pretty vulnerable. The SSP or exchange space is also uh, vulnerable. It looks like a race to the bottom, you know, yeah. in a largely sort of undifferentiated category. Uh, it's kind of hard to see how those companies are going to survive without becoming a component of a sort of a larger whole, uh, which can probably, which can probably be said for like most ad tech companies. Uh, but at the same time, I think that we're at the beginning of a of a new cycle, all right, so to speak, right? So I think that, you know, anytime, you know, the the saying goes, when when one door closes, another one opens. I think they're, we're going to see a next generation of ad platforms, um, scaled ad platforms, which which is basically what advertising, you know, requires. So there's there's a number of companies that are not strong yet in the space, uh, like, but that could be potentially like, you know, think about Comcast and Walmart and AppNexus and sorry, not AppNexus, but um, Apple, um, Netflix. Uh, these are all potential 
uh, acquires or potential um, big players in the in 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 the uh, in the ad tech space. Um, so I think that we're you know we're we're moving kind of towards a new epoch where you know it's potentially driven by you know a privacy first agenda, you know more contextual, um, maybe even you know ad networks making a comeback. Uh, so, so if you think about the last 10 years, the last innovation cycle has kind of been this split ecosystem with like the buy side and the sell side, you know, that could be an anomaly, right? If looking back, you know, in 20 years from now, we might look back on it and say like, that was, that was kind of anomaly. Um, there's a quote from a, from a venture capitalist, Jerry Newman, who said that, you know, ad tech startups are basically any company that hasn't, hasn't become an ad network yet. Um, and I think there's some, there's some truth to that. Um, so I think that what we're seeing is, you know, a move away from, the, I mean, this is this is a future outlook, but I think that it's going to take some time to play out. But I think that you know, closed is going to become the new open. Um, we're not going to see it instead of a duopoly. We're going to see a multitude of walled gardens. Um, you know, possibly, possibly a technology that's going to help marketers, you know, measure equally across them. That might hmm. be wishful. That might be wishful thinking, but uh, no doubt it looks like you know, it's not just going to be Facebook and Google for forever. I think there's going to they're going to face a lot of competition, and there's just going to be, you know. A, a multitude of platforms to buy on um, as opposed to, you know, the kind of ecosystem that we, um, that we see today. Agreed. Well, um, that's this year in ad tech. Yeah. Yeah. That's it for, that's it for today. And for, for kind of last year um, for everyone uh, that's still here, thanks for sticking through to the end. Uh, hope this was worth your while. Uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Terry. Thanks, Rocco. Bye. See you.